Thank you so much for choosing CAST TV. Welcome to the conversation with Michem Taikiri. Today, I'm privileged to be sitting down with Dr. Francis Oremo, who is not really a new face yet on the Conservation Conversation Program. I've asked him back to speak about the single-use plastic, which is seen to have huge effect on environment and our health. It's seen a lot of conversation surrounding the single-use plastic, and that's why I had to reach out to him to find out more about this issue and how we can play a part in eradicating it. Dr. Oremo is a researcher and project manager from the Center for Advanced Studies in Environment Law and Policy. He is also the head of climate change, water and energy program at the Institute for Law and Environment Governance. And as the manager of the Governing Plastic Network, Dr. Remo has first-hand knowledge on the issue of single-use uh, plastic, and that's why it's my honor to invite him to the program tonight. Karibu sana, Francis. I hope you're doing well. Thank you very much, uh, Chamtai, uh, for having me in this uh, very important program. I'm happy to share a few insights and some challenges related to plastics, and in particular, single-use plastics. As a correctly captured, I'm a project assistant and manager for Governing Plastic Network. A governing Plastic Network uh, uh, seeks to share knowledge and expertise around plastic governance approaches. And in doing this, we pay attention to reducing single-use plastic waste uh, through innovative approaches such as recycling, waste recovery, and uh, through campaigns focusing on enhancing, enhancing adop adop adoption of uh, reusable alternatives. Yes, many of us are aware of plastics and single-use plastics. Single-use plastics in this case just refer to the plastic materials that are discarded, abandoned, or even thrown away after single use. And examples of these plastics include uh, the category that we refer to as PET. This includes plastic bottles. Uh, we have, um, maybe you're aware of uh, plastic cups, different categories of plastics that once you've used it, you just throw it away. And now when you throw it away, it means that it accumulates in the environment uh, with serious impacts on ecosystems and human health. Uh, many people are not aware that plastic materials usually degrade into small particles that we call microplastics, usually of the size of less than five millimeters. And uh, some of these materials find their way into the water that we drink, into the food that we eat, and even sometimes in some of the beverages. And they contain some toxic materials that leach into our food and eventually affect our lives. We are also aware that some of this plastic uh, materials which have been thrown away or discarded into the terrestrial environment will eventually leach into the oceans, into the sea, and uh, will affect uh, uh, sea organisms. Uh, we are aware of images uh, of dead fish uh, or suffocated birds or some of the turtles and uh, uh, seabirds entangled, or which have died out of digesting plastics. These are common feature. And currently there's a global concern to have an international organization or a treaty 
that will deal with plastic waste, particularly marine plastic waste. Yeah. Thank you yes. for making us understand the impact of single plastic use on not only environment, but as human, you've mentioned how we ingest it through microplastic, right? Um, Kenya has been praised by international uh, uh, organizations on how we were quick uh, to adapt it when we talked about uh, burning single-use plastic bags. If that was really possible for us, what else can we do or what else are we working on in ensuring that we are managing this problem that you're speaking about? Yes, uh, I will start by saying that uh, globally, there's high level awareness of plastic impacts on environment and human health. And as a result of this impact, many countries globally and most African countries have moved ahead, developed a very progressive laws to ban uh, certain types of single-use plastics and uh, even come up with economic instruments that will reduce the consumption, the production or the importation of some of, some of the plastics. And apart from uh, legislative instruments that have been put in place, uh, different organizations have also come up with uh, voluntary measures to deal with plastics. Yes. However, serious challenge in uh, developing countries uh, as far as the use of legal measures uh, are concerned. The most serious challenge rests with the enforcement and implementation of some of these good laws. Uh, in Kenya, we made good and serious progress. In 2017, for instance, the government banned of carrier bags and flat bags. But there's one thing that you need to note about this, that this ban was only limited to carrier bags and flat bags. Uh, some of the single-use uh, plastic materials which are used for packaging uh, during production, for instance, in the industries, are not, have not been banned. You've seen most of the industries are still wrapping, packaging their products uh, in single-use plastic materials. And again, uh, we also have some bags uh, used by used uh, for biomedical waste. These have not been banned. And you've also seen some of the plastic bag, the waste, the, the bags we can normally use uh, for household plastic waste. Those are in operation, those are, are still being used. At the same time, even uh, single-use plastic bags at duty-free shops have not been banned. And the bulk of the single-use plastics are actually coming from packaging materials used during the production of different materials. And uh, again, in 2020, uh, the government moved or made further progress by banning the use of plastic bottles, uh, plastic straws in national parks, in conservation areas. And this was primarily done to ensure that uh, the wild animals in the park uh, do not ingest some of these plastic materials because we know the consequences of ingesting them, which is death of these wild animals. Yes, those, those are some of the measures which have been made by the government. But of course, you know, there is uh, mixed results. It's not uncommon to see some of these ban plastic bags uh, being used in some stores in urban centers and even in rural areas. Yeah. So that indicates that the enforcement is quite weak.
apart from uh, the use of legal instruments, the voluntary actions have also been quite good. We know that uh, voluntary organizations such as Petco, which is uh, an example of extended producer responsibility organization. The Petco has been in place, working voluntarily with different stakeholders to collect recyclable plastic waste. And recently, a second uh, extended producer responsibility company, Kepro, was also established just two months ago and is also working with different stakeholders on voluntary basis to collect uh, some of the plastic waste for recycling. But of course, despite all these efforts, we are, we are still seeing plastics uh, along the roadside. We are still seeing plastics choking drainage systems and waterways. We are still seeing plastics in open places. So what is really the problem? The problem here rests with the following. One is that as a country, we do not have adequate plastic recycling infrastructure. Uh, that means that most of the plastics that can easily be recycled cannot be recycled because we are not able to collect them. And even if we are not able, the infrastructure, the whole the system from collection to recycling is weak. And secondly, there is no adequate incentives uh, for reusable alternatives. Uh, we've done some research with the youths in Nairobi, especially in the Eastlands area and uh, their willingness to use alternatives is very high. But of course, there's need for some incentives to promote uh, the adoption of reusable alternatives. So there's a need for some proper concrete incentives to support the adoption of some of the reusables and alternatives, and also the need for adequate research to establish what are these alternatives that we need to use. And then again, uh, we also talk about uh, level of awareness. Yes, many people, many youths are aware of the impacts of plastics, but of course we still need to scale uh, the awareness to higher levels because uh, doing so will also ensure that there's some behavioral change among the public. Yes. Yeah. I love that you've talked about waste management initiative and I wanted to figure out, Dr. Tari, what do you think is the best alternative or the only alternative we can rely on at the moment when it comes to circular economy or eradicating this single-use plastic? Which one do you think is more likely for us in Kenya to adapt? Yes, the world over is currently moving towards uh, circular economy. And uh, we are all aware that uh, most single-use plastics can easily be recycled. But then how do we do it? I think the, the starting point uh, rests with awareness. And that now will lead us to having structures for waste recovery. And again, once we've been able to recover this waste and separate them, then from there, uh, we'll now be able to put in place adequate infrastructure for recycling. But even as we focus more on recycling, it is also important that we also find uh, viable alternative products to plastics. Because even some of these materials that have been recycled at one point, they will go towards end of life cycle and do not be able to recycle again and again and again. 
So the most important thing, have adequate recycling infrastructure, but then at the same time, promote the switch towards reusable alternatives. And for reusable alternatives, I've clarified just back, we need adequate and concrete incentives to promote the adoption and use of such alternatives. But more importantly, we should also have strong campaigns that will work towards building some collective responsibility for plastics. You know, in the absence of uh, such cultural change, it is difficult to obtain uh, some of the, the adequate results that we need. Yeah. Dr. As, even as we are uh, nearing the end of the conversation, I need to ask you this, right? Uh, you've mentioned clearly about the issue of creating awareness. And it's through my research, actually, on this uh, issue of plastic that the issue mentioned on microplastic ingestion came in mind. And for someone who is watching at home right now, probably uh, to, under to let them understand the impact of this, and why it's important for us to decide that if there's a better alternative than plastic, we better adapt to that because it's not only affecting the environment, which is actually impacting our livelihood. We did a little bit of feature when it comes to Lake Victoria and how the fish there already are already showing the signs of plastic impact, right? So how is this affecting us and what uh, steps should we take for ourselves? Yes, uh, it will be quite it's, it's quite difficult uh, for people just to make a switch uh, from single-use plastics to alternatives overnight. Yeah, this is uh, something that requires concerted and consistent campaign. And this campaign should focus on the environmental and health impacts of plastic pollution. One thing that the people are not aware of is that plastics are comprised of some toxic constituents that leach into our food chain, into the food and the water that we drink, and even some of the beverages or drinks such as beer. Because if you take, for instance, a plastic bottle or bottled water, for instance, that plastic bottle, when exposed to sunlight and maybe some environmental actions, will be able to degrade into smaller particles that you could not be able to see. But those particles have some toxic constituents that if it gets into your body, could potentially even cause cancer and other diseases. So if this information can really reach the people, the majority, and this information is consistently uh, put across, disseminated by the media and other organizations, then from there we'll be able to start seeing the impact. But that impact will only be possible if we provide our people with viable alternatives. We know how plastics have changed our lives. We know it is durable, it's cheap, it's light. And one of its most important strengths lies in its durability. But we need to ask ourselves, if something is durable, it takes years to degrade, that means that it will create mountains of waste and then the question is, how will we deal with this like mountain of waste? Because the strength is durability, but also that lies its disadvantage. It means it can accumulate and accumulate for mountains of garbage, mountains of plastics. Then how do we deal with that situation? And we know the impacts. So it is time for different organizations, including governments, first, to lead a consistent campaign 
and sensitize communities and users on its impacts. And then from there, support adequate research to come up with better alternatives and then incentivize such incentives so that most people can be able to adopt and use them. You've mentioned clearly, Dr. Ari, about the role that the government needs to do at this time to ensure that we are managing this issue. There's one thing you'd like the audience to know about the role that we as a community can play in this instance. What would that be? The government has a role to play, but the public is a critical part of the solution. We are all habituated to using plastics in our daily lives, but a major change can only be realized if we transform our behavior and also change our attitude and embrace alternatives. One thing that I just forgot to share with the listeners is that currently there's a push towards what we are calling extended producer responsibility. And what this means is that the manufacturer of plastics, for instance, uh, the companies producing plastics should have a responsibility on plastic waste. That the producers in this case should have a responsibility for the entire life cycle of plastic products. And that means that they are the ones who will be responsible for collecting the waste and having it recycled. That is a principle and a concept that is being developed globally. And we've been hearing this narrative that let the people do something. But now we are also shifting this burden to the producers to do something. And we believe the producers can do it well because they have the capacity and uh, if they are burden in one way or the other, then they are also best placed to lead us to the alternatives that we need. Yes. Thank you. But it is a responsibility for everyone, the producers and the consumers. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Remo, for gracing us again here on the conservation program. Unless there's anything else you'd like to add as you're finishing. I would particularly, particularly appeal to our young people, the youth, because we know they are habituated to using plastics. And again, being the future, people responsible for the future of our planet, I think they have a role if they can be able to develop uh, some collective responsibility and start embracing reusable alternative to plastics. Yeah. That would be a better start for us all. Thank you, Dr. Remo. I appreciate your time with us here. Have a blessed one. Well, you've heard from Dr. Francis Oremo, who is the researcher and project manager from the Center for Advanced Studies in Environment Law and Policy, and also the head of our Climate Change, Water and Energy Program at the Institute for Law and Environment Governance. Of course, he's led us to understand the impact of single-use plastic in the environment and, of course, how it affects our health as well. We're going to continue to have this conversation, just as Dr. Ria said, it's up to us to create awareness and ensure that we're making changes so that the legislators can hear us and help us in implementing these policies.
that's all for tonight. I'll see you on my next program. Continue watching the rest of our program. I have a lovely night.